the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Indian Trail.
with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave Cause I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear Cause I am a child of God Would you stand with us? My mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name, and I've been born again to your family. Your blood flows through my veins.
Lift it with your voice. I'm How many of you have had a time in your life somewhere that you turned away from sin, placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusted Him as your Savior and Lord? Hold your hand up good and high. Hold your hand up good and high. Now what does God say about you? He says, you're my child. You're my child. You forget that sometimes. I forget that sometimes. When the enemy comes or when we're going through issues and exigencies of life, when it just seems like the world turns upside down on us, we forget who we are. But more importantly, hey, we forget who he is in us. I think we need to be reminded. Where'd Steve go? Steve, come back over here. Come on, come on. I don't get you enough up here anyway. But when I get you, I want to keep you just a little bit. Well, you don't need your guitar. Uh, what'd you do with your guitar? No, 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 you're good with that. So let's just serve notice. You, you know, when we were singing that song, I have a tendency to forget the word fear. I'm no longer a slave to sin. You know, when, when sin used to come and, and tempt me, and, and, and I didn't have a choice, I just gave in to it, you know. But the day I got saved, April 12, 1970, I changed masters. And I'm no longer a slave to sin anymore. You know, no longer. I, I want us to sing one more time of that. And let's just serve notice on, our, on the enemy. And then let's remind ourselves, as God reminds us of who we are. And let's sing it like we really mean it. Okay, come on, Matthew. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer
I am surrounded. Do you know it? By the arms of the Father. And I am surrounded by songs of deliverance. And we So let us sing our freedom. We had if we had carpet on the floors, I'd hold this out. <laughs> I'd drop it <laughs> as sure as I'm standing. <laughs> Grateful you're here. I want you to welcome to the pulpit today one of my dear friends, Dr. Jim Henry. Um, he's been a hero of mine since the mid 1970s, early 1980s. I followed his ministry. Uh, for all of these years. He was Two Rivers Baptist in Nashville, Tennessee, went down to Orlando, Florida, First Baptist Church. God just poured himself into Jim and that whole community. They had to move out, grew a mega, mega, mega church, run five, 6,000 every Sunday morning. And then ironically, in his retirement, God sent him back to Orlando to go right back to the very location that he started with to begin with, to that building that uh, really the congregation was just about dead. They about to have to close the doors. Uh, all they needed was just throw the dirt over them. And God has gloriously used this man once again in the same location, revitalized that work. It is a tremendous, vibrant ministry today. Uh, Dr. 
Uh, we're just glad so much, Dr. Jim Henry, to have him at First Baptist. Let him know that you welcome him today. Right after the song, he'll come and preach. If you got your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 13 and verse 17. And in honor of God's word, would you stand with me as we read the word of God, and then after that you can be seated after I pray. Exodus 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. 
For God said if they faced war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. May God bless his word. Would you pray with me? Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And take this experience from your people generations ago and teach us today in the 21st century to walk with you in the wildernesses of life. I ask it to your glory alone. In the name of Jesus, your son, may you be blessed and honored now and throughout all generations. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. Through the years, I've talked to a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ and sometimes they'll say something like this you say I feel like I'm in a desert I feel like that I'm in a wilderness things have changed in my life things I, I, I just don't know why I'm in this position I don't know why this is happening and they feel like there's there's a sense of a loss of the presence of God and as they look at that they're they're, they're challenging their faith and they're challenged where, where is God in this what's happening to me why is this going on all of us usually will have some wilderness experiences like the children of Israel. When you look at this situation here, understand they have been slaves for 400 years and they've been brought out of Egypt and if they're going to the promised land, if you're walking it, in 10 days, they could be by the Via Maris, which is the way by the sea, they could be in the promised land because it's always, the, you know, the quickest way to a place is the shortest way. That was the shortest way. And so here are these people who have been slaves for all these years, 10 days from being in the land that God had promised their forefathers, and now all of a sudden it says God led them in a different way. Now understand, if you just kind of get a map with me, up here is Gaza, which you hear about today, the Gaza Strip. Down here is the Red Sea, and up here is the Dead Sea. It's kind of like a triangle, like this, if you look on a map. They're up here 10 days from Israel, the promised land. God led them this way away from the promised land. So they had to be asking, what's going on? What's happening to us? When you walk in your wilderness, God is showing us something. And so from this experience, let's look and see what happens in the deserts of the wilderness of our journey of faith. First of all, when you walk through a wilderness, and that wilderness had come sometimes by poor choices we make, sometimes it comes by circumstances that we had nothing to do with, sometimes it comes because of sin in our lives, sometimes it comes because Satan brings something on us, like Job, sometimes it comes because God does something. In this particular place, it says God led them into the wilderness. So I cannot determine that for you, nor probably can you, but you may be in a wilderness experience now, or you may be one probably in the future. So what do we learn from their experience? The Bible says the scripture is given that we might learn from their examples. So what do we learn? Number one, we learn God sees what we don't see. God sees ahead. We don't see. The children of Israel, they did not have GPS. They did not know when they were going to the Philistine country what was going to happen to them. They did not know how strong the enemy was. God knew that they weren't ready for war. He had to put them in the wilderness for what was going to come later. Sometimes our wilderness experience is God is preparing us for something else that's coming and he's getting us ready for something else because he sees what we don't see. When I was growing up, I lived near Vanderbilt University, and I used to park cars and sell programs and peanuts and Cokes, anything I took could get in a ball game and get close to the athletes. And after school, sometimes I'd run down to see if I could watch them practice their, their, for their games. 
And they usually put up a canvas around the, the a barbed wire fence there they had. Occasionally, there'd be a little hole in it. And I'd go and I'd look in that little hole. I could see who was in front of me. Couldn't see what was practicing down there, what's practicing over there, but I could see this. That's the way we live life. We see just this. God sees there. He sees there. And so we're walking, just looking through the knot hole of life, and God sees what's in front of us. So if you're walking through a wilderness, God sees what's in front of you. You don't see it, but God does. And in that, he's doing something in our good and for our favor. We walk through it. It's like a novel. When you read a novel, you're reading through it, but you don't know what's happened to the end of the story. And that's a part of the novel. What's going to happen to this character? What's going to happen to this person? We don't know, but the story is unraveling. Each of our lives, it's a raveling story of a novel, and we get to the end. God sees what's going to happen at the end. Isn't it a good thing to know that God knows what's coming down the road? And he leads us sometimes in and through a wilderness experience because we don't know the rest of the story. Pat and Effie used to be president of Baylor University and later governor of Texas, talked about two teachers who'd met for a reunion at the university. And he said the conversation went something like this as they caught up with each other after several years. The first lady said to her friend, I've gotten married since we last met. The second replied, oh, that's good. The first one replied, well, I don't know about that. My husband is twice as old as I am. The second replied, oh, that's bad. First responded, I don't know about that. He's worth over a million dollars. Second replied, oh, that's good. The first replied, well, I don't know about that. He won't give me a cent. Second replied, well, that's bad. The first said, well, I don't know about that. He just built a half million dollar house for me. The second one said, that's good. The first one said, I don't know about that. It burned down last week. First one said, well, that's bad. First one said, I don't know about that. He was in it. Well, <laughs> you don't know until you get to the end of the story. And so when we look at where we are in our situation, we don't know the end of the story. God does. When we go through the wilderness, looking through the knot holes of our experience, we trust a God who knows the end of the story. Second thing that we learn is in the wilderness experience, God uses it as a school in our faith journey. You know, we're all in school once we come to Christ. We come as babies, born again, and then we begin to go to school. And in that schooling, he's teaching us. What do we learn in the wilderness? One thing we learn in the wilderness experience is we learn about ourselves. The children of Israel who had been slaves for over 400 years, they didn't know about who they really were. This was a new kind of people going into a new land. And they had to move into that new land. And as they did, they had to learn about, can we do it? Can we handle it? We learn about ourselves in tough situations. My daughter played high school basketball. And when she started playing basketball, they wouldn't let the girls play past half court because they didn't think the girls had the stamina to play full court basketball. But they found out later they could do it and do it well because they had to learn that the girls learned about themselves. We're as tough. We can run up and down a court just like a guy can. We learn about ourselves in wilderness experiences. They had to learn to turn from the old life, the old gods, and the old securities. They had depended on that. They were slaves to the government, and now they were going to be an autonomous, independent people. One of the dangers we face in our country is that very thing that captured them for so many years. Some of them wanted to go back and lose their freedom. And here was a people that God said, no, no, no. I'm teaching you to be an independent, autonomous people, and I'm moving you away from the old life into a new life. But they had to learn about themselves. Stuart Briscoe, one of my favorite preachers, uh, Briscoe said that when he was younger, he wanted to be a Marine. He wanted to be a Marine because he liked their dress uniform, the blues. He wanted to, one of those outfits. And so he, he was sworn in to be a Marine. A few days later, he said, where's my uniform? And the officer said, what are you talking about? He said, I want one of those, those blues. I like that, that outfit that, you, that, that they have for Marines. He said, you don't get that yet. He said, well, why not? He said, son, let me tell you something. He said, when you took an oath to be a Marine, you became a Marine. You're a Marine then, you're a Marine for the rest of your life, simplify, you are a Marine. But you're not the Marine we want you to be. We're going to teach you how to dress. We're going to teach you how to hold your shoulders. We're going to teach you how to walk. We're going to teach you how to fire a weapon. 
We're going to teach you how to be a Marine. Once you have been taught how to be a Marine, which will take some time, then you'll get the uniform. What happens to us when we come to Christ? We become a believer. We can't lose our salvation. We're born again into the kingdom of God. Once saved, we say always saved. We're eternally secure in Christ. But he's teaching us through sanctification. That's a fancy word, but that's to make us in the image of Christ. And he's teaching us and we're moving along sanctified and we don't get through school till the end of our life. And then we become perfect in Christ. Until then, he's making spiritual Marines out of us. And so we learn about ourselves. We find ourselves in the crucible of heartache and challenge and difficulties. We learn about ourselves. We learn about the enemy. God knew the enemy was out there. Satan was going to come. You know, after a while, they got afraid. They wanted to go back. They said, what did we leave? We left our security. And I'm sure Satan came against these people, many of them. They wanted to lose their freedom to go back. They did not understand who the enemy was. And God had to teach them. There's enemy in the land and the enemy is against you. And he was against God's promise to his people. We'll learn about the enemy. Folks, spiritual warfare is real. There is a devil and there are demons. And the demons come against the people of God. So understand that when we come to Christ, that doesn't mean that nothing's going to happen. It means that you'll probably run into spiritual war. And when that spiritual war comes, because Paul talks about powers and principalities and darkness, spirits of darkness. He's talking about real things. He's not talking about something vague out there. He's talking about real entities that come against the people of God. So in the wilderness, you can expect the enemy to come against us, to make you doubt God, to make you doubt his faithfulness, to make you doubt his presence. He's going to come against you. Sometimes we open ourselves up to the enemy. You know, when we they say, can a believer be demon-possessed? I don't think so. But I think a, demer, a Christian can be demon-oppressed. And what happens is the enemy comes in as a squatter. He can't own us because Christ owns us. But he comes in as a squatter. You know what a squatter is? That's someone that moves into territory and says, that's mine. He don't pay any rent. He don't own it. don't have a title to it. But he acts like he does. And the enemy comes in as a squatter. And we let him in sometimes. We let him in sometimes through the occult. Sometimes it's innocent. Play Ouija boards or seances or go to mediums or things like that. Sometimes it's through alcohol or a drug. Sometimes it's through excessive sin. We get into something. We stay in that sin. And what happens? We open ourselves up to the squatter to come in. And we have to be careful. We have to deal with that. We realize that it's the enemy. Confess whatever it is as sin and walk away from it. It has to be dealt with. One of the biggest challenges today for men and women is pornography. And pornography attacks the mind. They know now that when pornography, a person is addicted to pornography, it's like making holes like Swiss cheese in your brain. And it has to be healed physically and spiritually. So because the enemy comes against us to do what? To get to our minds. I was a, a young man, a couple came to our church. And he said, Pastor, I got to see you. He came by for talk for a while. And he, they were faithful to church. Seemed like they're loving the Lord, growing in Christ. He said, Pastor, I'm afraid. I said, afraid of what? He said, I'm afraid I'm going to commit suicide. I said, what? He said, I'm afraid I'm going to commit suicide. I said, what are you talking about? He says, every time we cross the river, he says, I want to stop the car and jump off in the river. He said, I start shaking when I get to the river. I said, come on. Come on. You're just, it, you're just riding across the river. He said, I know it. And so I began to ask him about things in his life. And we were... Everything checked out. And then I, I said, did you, anything in your past that you did or got into that dealt with spiritism or mediums or channeling or anything? He said, no, no, no. He said, oh, oh I, don't know. I know something. He said, when I was in college, he said, me and a bunch of guys, we decided to go to a palm reader. I said, what happened when you were at the palm reader? So oh, I held out my hand and she looked at the lines and she talked a few minutes and she said, you're going to die before your 35th birthday. You're going to die young. I just laughed it off. I didn't think anything about it. I said, that's it? I said, how old are you? He said, 34. I said, you see what's happening? The devil is trying to kill you. 
and you're nearing your 35th birthday, and that seed that he planted when you were a teenage kid in college is now blossoming. I said, let's confess it as sin, take authority over it by the power and the blood of Jesus, and walk away from that because he can't have you. You belong to Jesus. He did that, got up, came next Sunday I saw him. I said, how was it coming across? He said, didn't bother me a bit. I didn't shake a bit. I'm ready to go. What happened, the enemy was coming after him. The enemy will come after you in your wilderness experience to make you fear that God has left you or gotten into your life and you can't do anything about the enemy. And there's a tendency not to know your enemy. Know that oftentimes in the wilderness, Satan will come after you. There's a third thing you learn in the wilderness. Learn about God. Yourself, the enemy, and about God. What did they learn about God? They learned his provision. Can you imagine two million people in the wilderness? And the wilderness doesn't mean trees. It's barren land. You've been to that part of the world. You know, it's basically barren. Can you imagine how much food it took every day? How much water it took every day to provide for two million people? And so, how are they going to get through this wilderness? The Bible says that God gave them food and water and even their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. They found God's provision. They found God's protection in the wilderness. They were out there. They couldn't do much. They had some arms, but they, they hadn't been fighting. They weren't a fighting machine yet. They weren't ready for that. So what happens, God puts a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, which represented the presence of God, and he protected them. They found his protection, they found his, they found his provision, and they found his power. They found that he could deliver them in the midst of their wilderness. And when you walk through your wilderness, you're going to find God's power, God's provision, and God's presence and protection. That's going to happen. They found that. Now, sometimes God may withdraw temporarily your sense of protection or provision. Okay? Not permanently. But when that happened, he did that as a test. Will you trust me when it seems like I'm not there? Because the devil will come to try to oppress you, which is outside and suppress you that's inside to work on your mind. And so God says, okay, let me back off just a little bit. Will you trust me? Will you trust me when you don't feel me? And they had to learn about God, sometimes in the sense of his absence. Someone has said the silence of God does not mean the absence of God. So if you're in a wilderness experience, it seems like God is way, way off. And you sense a sense of lostness or a feeling of, I'm in this by myself. God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. So the desert, the wilderness that you may be in, God uses as a school to prepare us for the promised land. And that's the third thing that I think we see in this passage. And that is, God changes us in the wilderness. You never go through the wilderness the same. You won't come out the same. In the wilderness, there's three kind of people that live in the desert. One are nomads. And you know, that's the kind of people that wander, like the Bedouins. They go from place to place. They still stay in the desert, but they move their sheep and their goats from place to place to get forage and water. The second group of people that live in the desert are hermits. They're people that find a hole or place, and they just kind of get in there and stay there. They don't move out anywhere. They stay there. Third kind of people in the wilderness are pilgrims. They're going through the wilderness. God did not want his people to be nomads. He did not call them to be hermits. He said, you're passing through this wilderness to the promised land. Every believer, when we are saved from slavery, that's represented in the Bible as Egypt, we're going to the promised land that's heaven. En route, we'll go through wildernesses. And we're never the same when we go through a wilderness experience. You just, things change in your life. When our kids went into, uh, in the Gulf War in the early 90s, one of our chaplains was meeting with them the night before they were to start in. 
And as he talked to them, he said, I want you to know you're not the first people to be in the desert. He said, there are many people who are in the desert and had desert experiences like you're having. He said, Moses has been here. Just reading about that. He said, John the Baptist has been in the desert. He said, Elijah's been in the desert. He said, Paul was in the desert. Jonah was in the desert. Jesus was in the desert. And he said, the thing about it, I want you all to remember that none of those people came out of their desert experiences unchanged. You will go through your desert experience, your wilderness. But what you face in combat, you'll never be the same. When we go through the wilderness, we do not come out unscathed or unchanged. Things happen in our lives. And we learn about God and the enemy. And we learn about ourselves. Through that wilderness experience, we learn, as Peter Marshall said, Forbid it, Lord, that our roots become the firm so firmly attached to this world that I would fall in love with this world and with things. I want to be a pilgrim, and my pilgrimage is a preface for what is to come. So you're going through a wilderness in your life. And many of you are today, I know that. I've pastored for nearly 60 years. I know that many of you, sometimes we don't talk about it to a lot of people, but God knows. And it comes from many different sources. And you're in a wilderness. But in that wilderness, God's going to do something in your life that's very special. And it's going to be a blessing to others. Okay? About six years ago, uh, in our family, just a personal, we've had several, but this one really came pretty hard on us. My beautiful wife, my bride of over 50 years, uh, started her journey with Alzheimer's. And so when the doctor looked at me and said, buckle your seatbelt, Jim, you're in for a, a, a wild ride. I did not know all that ride was going to be, and I'm still in it. But I found out a lot in this wilderness about God about me, about the enemy. I'm learning a lot. And I'm watching my wife lose a sense of reality. She doesn't know me sometimes. I'm sometimes her daddy. And so I'm having to learn a new normal with somebody that I've walked intimately with over 50 years. So it's a, it's a different world. I hate Alzheimer's dementia. I hate it. And I hope God will lose somebody to come up with something to help people not to get it or to get them out of it. But it is what it is. It's a wilderness for us. She doesn't realize she's in it so much. But we all around her do. But one thing I found out is that down deep in your heart, when you plant God and his presence in a person's life, he doesn't leave. She still sings the hymns at church. I can see her mouth in the words. She still sings the old hymns because that's there. And every night, she always read her Bible. And so every night, I go in with her, and I get her Bible. And I say, do you want to read the Bible? She said, yeah, read the Bible. And I read different scriptures. And I said, do you want to pray? She said, uh-huh, I want to pray. Do you want to pray tonight? No, no you pray. And sometimes she'll pray. And when she prays, it's just like I'm talking with you. It's clear. It's just an amazing thing. She's just like where she used to be. After that, I turn out the light, leave a light on in the bathroom so she can see, and I tuck her in. We always kissed each other good night, always. Sometimes it wasn't easy because I was mad about something. But, <laughs> you know, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, so I just, I'll kiss you anyway. <laughs> And so I tuck her in, and I tell her three things. I get down real close to her face, and I say, honey, I love you. And she'll always say, I love you. Second thing I say, I've got your back. And she'll always say, I've got your back. Every once in a while, she'll say, I've got your tummy. 
if that's all right too. The third thing I'll say is I'm here for you. I want her to know she's secure. And I think, and I think about Jesus in our experiences. I love you. God loves you. Jesus loves you so much. He died on the cross for our sins. How great our love could that be? Secondly, I'm here for you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. No, never. I'm here for you. So in your wilderness, God's with you. And I've got your back. I go before you. I go behind you. I'm looking over you and around you are the everlasting arms. I've got you. So as you walk through your wilderness, remember, God is using your wilderness to bring glory to him and to bring you closer to him. And you'll pass through to the other side. Would you bow your heads as we pray? I want to do something. I want to pray for those of you. I don't know you. I don't know hardly anybody here. But God does. I want to pray for you uh, who are going through wilderness experience. I want to do it real quickly. Then after that, we're given a public invitation for those of you that Jesus is calling to himself to be saved. Do you know that you know that you know? Have you put your faith in Christ alone? If not, right where you're seated, just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I trust you, Jesus, alone to save me. If you prayed that, he heard you. We invite you in a moment to come forward, take the pastor by the hand and say, I've trusted Jesus. Some of you want to join this church. We'll invite you to do that. Some of you want to come and be baptized. As a witness of your faith and obedience to Christ, you come. But before that, I want to pray for you who are in a wilderness experience of some kind. So quietly would everyone stand with heads bowed. Quietly would you stand right now. Bow your heads. And now I want to write a brief prayer. If you are in a wilderness experience, I just want you to put up your hand and put it back down. Just wherever you're standing, just hands up and hands down. In the balcony, yes. If you're in a wilderness experience, I see all over the place, yeah, okay. Hands down, hands down. Dear Father, you have seen every hand because you know every heart. And I ask you right now for these, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that whatever that wilderness is, that your word and your presence will become so fastened into their minds and hearts, so glued in, so anchored in, that they will keep their eyes on you and know that you are the pillar of fire and the cloud by day and night, 24-7, that the enemy cannot get them, that they will come through to the other side. And so I pray that they'll take that wilderness they're in And turn it in to an experience that will make them more like you and love you the more. And be a witness to those around of your faithfulness. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.